Uh, welcome, Professor Singh. Um, we are at the International Conference um, on Shaping and Interpreting in Transformative Constitutions, and you're one of our speakers who is speaking um, on the Indian experience and the Indian Constitution. What are some of the key issues that you think we can borrow from your context insofar as uh, the progressive realization of economic, and social, and cultural rights is concerned? I think uh, the most important thing in view of the fact that you already have your constitution which is uh, very detailed and uh, clearly transformative in the sense that it is making a break from the uh, previous constitutions and previous regimes. The most important aspect which uh, the constitution could learn is uh, the way in which the judges have interpreted our constitution uh, since uh, mid-1970s, uh, creating uh, those rights and remedies for the people which uh, were envisaged by the constitution makers as the requisite uh, rights for the purpose of bringing that kind of transformation which they wanted to have in the society. And this transformation was, of course, primarily for justice, social, economic, and political, for freedom, for equality of status and opportunity, for fraternity, and human dignity. And uh, these uh, ideals were uh, incorporated into the fundamental rights and the directive principles of a state policy. To begin with, our courts also uh, had some uh, kind of inhibition uh, in interpreting these constitution, uh, these provisions in a very progressive manner. But uh, in view of uh, the emerging conflict that arose between the judiciary on the one side and the other two branches of the government on the other side, <coughs> the courts realized that uh, the way they were interpreting the constitution, they were not uh, carrying the people along with them. People were by and large with the legislature and the political bosses rather than with the uh, judiciary. Now, therefore, the judges in, the, uh, in Kenya have to actually uh, look into the kind of uh, methods the judges uh, in India have used since uh, mid-1970s. Often we find that there's, uh, there, there's conflict between different arms of government, um, where the judiciary is at loggerheads with other arms of government, the executive and the legislature. What can we do um, and what are your proposals for our judiciary in terms of mitigating these conflicts and so that the judiciary is able to perform its mandate as per the constitution? Firstly, the judiciary has to accept that uh, in Kenya, as uh, was the case in India, majority of the people are living a life uh, which is not fully dignified. And uh, uh, some of them really uh, live a life which is hardly worth living, but uh, they have to live. Uh, now, it is the condition of the people that has to be uh, changed. So far as well of people are concerned, uh, they don't require uh, much change, but so far as these downtrodden, uh, weak and poor uh, people are concerned, uh, they require uh, uh, support from the new constitution and the new government. And therefore, the uh, Supreme Court has to realize that who these people are and what uh, rights of theirs as already written into the constitution need to be materialized, need to be implemented. And it is in support of them that they have to actually uh, give their uh, decisions, which decisions are like in India, they need not be supported by some concept of life or something. Uh, they are very explicitly written into the constitution. The only thing is 
that the court has to remind the government that you are under an obligation under the new constitution to uh, ensure social and economic rights of the uh, people. And for that, uh, the court should uh, devise the new methods as the courts in India have done. Um, how do you reconcile the role of the judiciary and politics? Mm -hmm. um, and in, in your response, perhaps you can shed light on how the judiciary has handled electoral disputes in your country mm -hmm. um, and how the judiciary enhances constitutionalism mm -hmm. when it deals with the broader issue of electoral governance. Yeah, uh, so far as electoral issues are concerned, uh, these days not too many issues concerning the electoral process come before the courts. But yes, in the beginning, just as it is the beginning in Kenya, there were lots of uh, uh, electoral disputes. And for that purpose, even the uh, constitution had to be amended to make it uh, easy to have uh, decisions in electoral uh, uh, matters and it was actually a electoral matter which uh, created the final rift between the breaking point between the legislature between the political wings of the government and the uh, judiciary mrs gandhi's elections case where it was invalidated by the court uh, that an emergency was imposed and uh, then uh, a new government came and then the uh, changes started but even now, in view of the fact that uh, elections uh, have to be fair and democracy is uh, recognized by our courts as one of the basic features of the Indian constitution, which cannot survive unless there is an equality in the matter of elections. And for that reason, those who uh, exercise corrupt practices, if they keep on winning the elections, then corruption would prevail and uh, the uh, money will not be available for uh, uh, the support of the poor and the weak and uh, those plans which are required for their or even in national interest. And for that reason it is necessary that uh, there must be a control on the elections of the courts. And for that reason the uh, Supreme Court uh, during the last few years has given several judgments by which uh, uh, the corruption in the uh, election matters has been minimized to the maximum possible extent. And even the ministers uh, who were found indulging in corrupt practices by the courts, uh, they have been dislodged from the membership of parliament and naturally, automatically from the ministry also. This has happened in the last few years. Okay. In conclusion, Professor, what are the key outcomes for you from this process? And what kind of conversations do you envision for the future in regard to constitutionalism um, and um, conversations around how we shape and interpret constitutions? Yeah, I think uh, this has been a very uh, common matter that people learn from each other's experiences. Although, of course, uh, uh, life experiences of each one may be different. Societies may also be different. But uh, uh, I am sure that uh, in view of the fact that uh, the varieties of law uh, are divided into certain kinds of uh, families or traditions. And uh, since uh, the traditions uh, in respect of the application of new constitutions are slowly becoming universal, I think uh, many of the things which work in other constitutions would also work in uh, Kenya. It is not that everything has to be copied. But uh, you have to choose, judges particularly, lawyers, and the academics have to actually examine carefully as to what is worth learning and taking from 
other constitutions and other systems. Therefore, this kind of uh, dialogue must continue, uh, I would say, repeatedly and constantly.